Good afternoon. Can you read me? Can you hear me? Okay. I'm Dave Ferguson, Dean of the Estopanol College of Architecture and Planning, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first uh, in the guest lecture series for CAP this year. Um, we are excited to uh, start off with Mike Mallon, who we will introduce in a minute, but I also wanted to give you a heads up on uh, what's coming for uh, the rest of our speaker series uh, as, uh, up, to, up to this semester. So we have uh, Marion Weiss and Michael Manfredi, Weiss Manfredi, well-known architectural firm. Um, originally scheduled for October 4th, we're, as of today, trying to move them into a situation where instead of being virtual, they can be here in person. And uh, so we'll have a new date on that soon. On November 1, we'll have Autumn Visconti from BIG, also virtually. Uh, and then on November 15th, we'll have our good friend Tony Costello, uh, Professor Emeritus, discussing his two decades of work in Haiti. Uh, he'll be live on campus, and we're looking forward to that. So we want to welcome those of you here at the Muncie Mall, which is a great location and outpost for our community-based efforts, uh, sponsored by the Urban Planning Department. And we want to welcome everybody who's joining us in AB 100 back on campus, as well as the live stream to our alums and friends. If you uh, want details on continuing education credits, you can email caplectures at bsu.edu, and we'll take care of it. And if you have questions today, please email them to planning at bsu.edu. We'll be monitoring that account, and we'll relay your questions to Mike at the end of the presentation. Now, before, I, uh, before we see Michael Beridi, who's going to be doing the intro for Mike, uh, there's a short video that kind of sets the stage for today's topic. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today. Mike Malone has more than 40 years experience in the Chicago market, working on planning and zoning issues and real estate development for multiple firms. Today, he is managing partner of Malone & Associates, a real estate and development company. He works with site clients as Walmart and Aldi, and has developed more than 180 grocery stores and drug stores across the country. He holds a certified real estate executive designation with the International Council of Shopping Centers, the very first site designation, I'm told. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of Illinois. So please join me and giving him a hearty welcome to Muncie and to Ball State. Thank you very much, Professor. You know, I may be in the wrong room. Maybe you could help me out. This is my first time I've ever been to Muncie Mall. But I'm confused because it feels a lot more like a library in here. And I know there's probably people studying somewhere 
They're probably working on maybe some case studies in the back room here. But I want to tell you, this is not going to be a library, and I don't want you to be quiet for the next 45 minutes or so. Would you do that for me? I want you to get engaged. I want you to participate. All right? Can I hear you? Yes. Now, again, I've taken my mask off because I asked to make sure that that was fine. I am fully vaccinated, and I'm fully caffeinated because I've gone ahead and spent the last four hours driving down from Chicago to visit you here in Muncie. I've been to Muncie one time in my life. So if somebody thinks that I'm going to solve all of your issues or your problems, again, you're in the wrong spot. What I'm here to do is to share with you some ideas, maybe plant a seed or two, and hopefully, hopefully help you in the future. You know, when I first got here and I was talking with Michael, um, I said, you know, interesting enough, I do have some ties to Muncie and to Ball State. I want, how many people in here are working on their planning degree? Everybody? Okay. I don't know if you know this, I'm an urban planner also. I got my degree from Michigan State way, way, way back when we won our first national championship in basketball. So that would have been back in 79. And what's interesting is I, like you, was looking for a job. How many people here are interning? Are you doing any internships? No? Usually in the summer. OK. I went ahead and I worked when I was at Michigan State. I was a bartender, interesting enough, as well as I interned in Meridian Township which was a high growth area outside of East Lansing. And, interesting enough, I ended up going to the APA National Conference in Miami, Florida. And again, I know that that's coming up for you guys. How many people might go to the conference? Okay. Now, one of the things that was there when I went was there were municipalities, there were private consulting firms, and they had what was called a job fair. Is there one of those at APA? Do you know? And so I think that there probably is. I went, and I flew down with about eight of my college planners. And uh, we got into one room, because that's all we could afford at the time, the Fountain Blue. And we started to get dressed up. And interesting enough, my friends who were drinking beers, and at the, full disclosure, the drinking age was 18 at the time, and they were drinking beers in the room. And I said, hey, what are you guys doing? They said, Where are you? what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to the opening cocktail reception. And they said, that sounds boring. And I said, okay, you stay here. So I went to the opening cocktail reception, walked the room a little bit, introduced myself around to a few different people. Lo and behold, the guy that I interned with in Meridian Township was there at the cocktail party. So I gravitated towards him to basically, you know, engage with him, have a little bit of a conversation. And as I was standing there, a guy came bopping up who Joe, who I worked with, knew from the year before. His name was Tom Taylor. I didn't know Tom at the time, but I'll tell you this. I got to know Tom very quickly. He asked me what I was doing there. I told him I was a student. I was going to school for urban planning, and I was at the conference to do what? To network and to get a job, OK? And he said, we're looking for a planner. Why don't you come by my booth tomorrow, and we'd love to interview you. Well, long story short, I went to work for the village of Lombard, which is a community outside of Chicago. Anyone here familiar with Lombard? You are? Why are you familiar with it? Oh, perfect. Yeah, so it's a western community, about 40,000, has a mall, and most importantly, they had a job for me. And so I then started my planning career working for the village of Lombard. About seven and a half years later, I got a call from who? Who did I get a call from? Come on, follow along here. Tom Taylor. Tom called me. Tom called me and he said, hey, 
what do you know about shopping centers? And I said, what's there to know about shopping centers? And guess what? The company he was working for, which is the same company that I went to work for back then and that I've been now working with for the last eight years or so, was Draper and Kramer. And so they went ahead and they hired me because they realized the value in urban planners and the fact is that they have a good basis to kind of work off of. So I went ahead and I gave you guys some business cards earlier today. I want you to feel free to engage with me on LinkedIn. I want you to feel free to talk to me as you go down through your college career and you move on. I really believe in a former life. I think I was a headhunter. And I love, love to get planning students an opportunity to get into their first, second, or third job. So if I can ever be of any help, please don't hesitate. Fair enough? OK, great. So let's go ahead and let's just jump in, jump in here. Um, it's, it's hard to believe that I think it was about two years ago when I was uh, back at Michigan State and I was a guest speaker. And I was talking to them about retail, and I was talking with them about development. And in fact, some of the things that I'm going to share with you, I shared with them. Needless to say, it's been a hell of a ride, hasn't it? over the last year and a half, almost two years now, in regards to obviously COVID. But I'm happy to say I've been safe, I've been healthy, and hopefully the same goes with you. Everyone's doing fine? Anyone get hit by COVID? No? Well, that's, that's good. Well, hopefully, hopefully through today's discussion, you're going to basically get a better understanding about retail and certainly a lot of the challenges that we are going through but also with that, some of the opportunities. I think that some of my insights, as well as my experiences, might help you as you work on the project, the charrette, that I believe is going to be starting on October 20th here at Muncie Mall. And again, think of me as a resource. If I can be of any help on that, I'm literally an email, a text, a phone call away. Fair enough, OK? We got some ground rules. Okay, and I apologize, I have a hard time standing still. So I'm gonna occasionally walk out just so that I can engage with you a little bit better and you're gonna lose me obviously because of the screen here. But I have a ground rule, okay? I want you to participate, okay? You can, you can write anything you want down, but I'm gonna tell you, there's going to be no test today. I guarantee you, no test today. Everyone's gonna ace the class. The idea here is to take away some ideas, meet some new people, and get kind of familiar with them, okay? But I'm a little bit old school, and you guys might not remember maps. Not the map that's on your, your, uh, your iPhone, but the map that I used to have when I would go out and look at real estate. So what I try to do is I want to give you a little bit of an outline in terms of where we're going to go today, okay? Perfect. How's this? A little bit better. Okay, so we're going to start off. I want to get to know you a little bit. I'm going to share with you a little bit of background, again, about myself a little bit, but also about my company that I'm involved with. We're going to talk about state of retail as I see it. And my, my lens may be a little bit different than what you read in the media, what you see on your iPhone, or what you may also see in the mall here. I have been a retailer for about 14 years. I ran the real estate program for Jewel Osco, which was the leading, mark, leading grocery store in the Chicagoland area. I see a head bopping. You're familiar with Jewel? No, I just listen. Oh, OK. Well, good. I love it when people listen, but I love it even more when they raise questions. So ground rule is to participate. I know towards the end here, I've got a Q&A period, but if all of a sudden you're, you're sitting there and I strike a nerve, or you disagree, or you want to add something, hey, go ahead, raise your hand, throw it in there, and let's talk about it, okay? So don't have to wait to the end. Got to participate. We're going to talk about life after COVID if there's such a thing. And I'm not sure there ever is going to be life after COVID. 
I think that this thing is going to be with us for a while. And like anything else, we just have to deal with it. And I like to think that we're dealing with it right now as good as we can, and hopefully we'll get better. We're going to spend a little bit of time. We're going to talk about retail trends as well as analysis. We're going to dive into the future of regional malls as well as the future of retail. Because I'll tell you this, it is changing so fast and so quickly, it makes it very difficult for people like myself to keep up with it. I think that that's good. Because for a long time, retail was very slow and methodical. When I was in, and I'm still in the grocery store business, but in the grocery store business, we thought all we needed to do was put our cans of corn on the shelf and our box of cereal, and guess what? You're going to come in and buy it. And we realize now that that's not the case. You want something more than just a box good. You want to be able to have an experience, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about that in terms of what does that mean moving forward. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what's hot and what's not as it relates to the retail arena. We're going to have a little bit of a Q&A period, time permits. And again, if I could just ask if somebody in the room could let me know when we maybe have about a half an hour from now, just so that I can get kind of close to the time. And then last but not least, for you as well as our audience at home, I have brought gifts. Now, how many times have you gone to a presentation or a lecture and somebody has given you a gift? Never, okay? I learned early on that if I brought gifts, that people might stick around, okay? Would you stick around to the end? And then we'll get you a guys a gift. And that gift will be something that keeps on giving for a long time. I mentioned earlier about my business card, okay? How many people here in the room have a business card? You have. Why do you have a business card? Oh, no, no, that's good, that's good, that, that's good. So you get, a, you get a star for that, okay? But how many people have a business card with your name on it? You do, Mr. Lake Zurich. Why? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things that in today's world, you know, people think that paper is done, but there's something magical about a business card, okay? It's something for a networking event, a cocktail party like I had when I went to in Miami, or just if you're out. And, and again, business cards can be, you know, I, I can... I, got one on my phone that I can just send to you. She's always listening to me, okay? But business cards really do serve a purpose. And I would strongly encourage all of those people that raise their hands that are going to the APA conference, get a business card, okay? Just put your name on it, you know, student, Ball State, architecture, planning, and uh, obviously email, your Twitter accounts, or whatever you want to put on there. But that information is helpful because again, you and me are trying to do the same thing. And that's network, okay? You're never too old to network. When I was invited by the university to come down here, I jumped at the chance. The fact that you were gonna listen to me, the fact that we we're gonna talk about something that is passionate for me, which is retail, and again, I'm gonna hopefully make a few new friends. And so, seriously, network, 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 Build your relationships, and then remember, remember this, which is real important. You can't always be a taker. And what I mean by that is somebody is going to send me a note over the next couple of weeks and basically reintroduce themselves to me and uh, maybe ask for a, a, a job or ask for a cup of coffee, which is great, and I want to encourage you to do that. We can do a Zoom, and if you want to pick my brain about how do you get into this field? Or do you know somebody at JLL? Please, take advantage of that. But keep in mind that relationships are what? They're two-way. They're giving and they're taking, OK? So it's a little bit like putting money in the bank. And eventually, maybe you want to withdraw something. And then hopefully, that's positive back towards you. But the one lesson that I want you to leave today with, OK, not, we're not over yet. The one lesson I want you to leave is, if it wasn't for that guy from Muncie, 
back in 1979 that went out of his way to interview me and to hire me, I'll tell you, I would not be who I am and where I'm at, and I certainly wouldn't be at Muncie Mall today. Okay? So, hey, let's get into this. we got a lot to cover in a short period of time. But, again, remember the ground rules. Okay. I guess I probably should hold this here a little bit. So a little bit about my company, uh, Draper & Kramer, and I am the consulting arm of Draper & Kramer, which is Mallon & Associates. This is the firm, again, that I engaged with back in about 1985. We are a full-line real estate firm. We operate really throughout the United States. We just celebrated, what is it, our 128th year in business? So we've been around a long time. We're going to talk about a couple of malls that we actually developed back in the 70s. And those are a couple of examples that I'm going to use in our discussion today. We're doing a lot of apartments right now, uh, primarily in the Chicagoland area. We recently bought some things up in Schaumburg, Palatine. Uh, so out in the Chicagoland area, we're active right now in St. Louis. Anyone familiar with uh, the Cubs? Wrigleyville, okay. Uh, Wrigley Field, we have a 125 residential unit, seven story building, two and a half blocks from uh, Wrigley, Wrigleyville. And uh, we are now starting the end of this week, starting to lease those spaces out. I have about 12,000 square feet of retail on the ground floor. A lot of what we do is mixed use development. So primarily residential, but then some element of retail. In this project, we're going to be having Ace Hardware uh, I also have a couple of restaurants. We'll do a convenience food store. And last but not least, although I don't drink it, we'll also have a coffee shop in there. This gives you a little bit of an overview in terms of really where throughout the United States that we're, we're located. And also on there, I've identified some of the markets that we're also focusing in on growing it. Okay? You're sitting back here and you're saying, wait a minute. Um, you please call me Mike if that's okay. All right. You're, you're saying, wait a minute, I'm from Seattle or I'm from Denver. I may know of an opportunity. Hey, send me a note. Give me a call. Let me know. Okay. That's this exchange of ideas that we're going to have. Okay. I know where this gentleman is from in terms of Lake Zurich. How about everybody else? Just kind of tell me a little bit where you're from. How about you there, sir? Baltimore, Maryland. What brought you to Ball State? fallback position well hi. hey how many people here came to Ball State because of the School of Architecture and Planning was there any you did a lot well-known school um, was anybody else in a different field and then got you're in the back Where, what did you start off with uh, broadcasting. broadcasting and then what brought you to urban planning Okay. Ah, very good. Well, hey, I went to school to, to become an attorney. Couldn't you see me debating the case uh, in front of the Supreme Court? And not unlike you, I discovered girls my sophomore year, and then I quickly realized that, you know what, I'm not sure I'm cut out for the whole law school thing. And I went and talked to my counselor and she went ahead and told me about urban planning and thought that it matched up a little bit with my skills or my interest. I took my first urban planning class my sophomore year, and it was with a, teach, uh, an, a practicing planner who was from Boston. And I was into a, probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes, into a two and a half hour class, and I thought to myself, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to be that planner because he was passionate. He was engaging. And have you ever taken a class here at Ball State where there's a practitioner that's teaching the class? I don't know about you, but those were some of my best classes. You know, if you can have somebody that can educate you and teach you the skill sets that actually is doing it on a day to day basis, to me, that's pretty powerful in this game of things. Okay. Um, I'd love to start off our discussions with a question, okay? 
and it's, it's none of the above, or it can't be all of the above. It's real simple. I'm going to go ahead and start a sentence, and what I'd like you to do is to finish it, okay? So we'll go ahead and we'll just kind of start, we'll go across the room. I want you to just really the first thing that pops into your mind, okay? Keep it short. Maybe it's a couple words. Fair enough. Ready? Okay, you got to get engaged here. Okay, retail is. Come on, give me an answer. Dying. Dying, okay. Retail is. Confusing. That's interesting. I've never quite heard that before, but I want to dig into that a little bit. Retail is. Come on, how about this table here? Complex. Changing. Changing. Very good, I love that. How about over here? Retail is. Diverse, okay. Anybody else? Oversaturated, yes. Never ending. Never ending. Wow, okay. Anybody else have something different? Vibrant. vibrant. Oh my gosh, what retail mall have you been in recently that's been vibrant? Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Minnesota, so Mall of America. Ah, okay. What makes Mall of America exciting? Nothing. nothing. <laughs> Is that retail as nothing or Mall of America? Mall of America. Okay. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota as well. So okay. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that retail is confusing, complex, dead. It's going through a lot of different changes to say the least, okay? So what I wanna do is we'll circle back towards the end and see if we can kind of come to some consensus in terms of where retail is at. But uh, I think you guys have hit on really all of the hot spots. I mentioned before about the media. And don't get me wrong because I read, I listen, anything that's retail, uh, I want to I wanna hear about. And for some reason, some reason, the media feels that retail is dying and it's dead. Now again, as we walk around Muncie Mall here, you know, there are some stores here. Some of them seem to be doing well. We've got a lot of vacant opportunities here, but I'll tell you this. Retail is not dying. It is not dying at all. And again, the easiest thing to answer the question, I believe, is basically retail is changing. But again, open up the newspaper. There's a retail apocalypse out there. Last year, over 10,000 stores closed their doors and many went bankrupt. You know, I can name some names, you know, whether it's Pier One, Sears, Macy's, okay? Macy's closing stores. Macy's Marshall Fields, you're obviously familiar with that. Bed Bath & Beyond. We had over 150 million square feet of retail close last year. You know what I did last year during the, the, during the heat of pandemic? I went ahead and I worked with a group out of New York and I worked with retailers that were in bankruptcy. And what I did is I repositioned their leases because in many cases, the retailers had a good idea, a good concept. The problem is that they couldn't afford to be in business. Their rent and their charges were much higher. And so I used that opportunity to work with the landlords to reposition that lease and to keep retailers like Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, DSW, you know, in business. Now some landlords, didn't necessarily want to engage with me in negotiations, and they took the approach that that's okay. I'll take that space back and I'll release it. But I would say over 75% of the landlords that I dealt with, and we renegotiated 1,500 leases in about a four month period of time, we were able to change that. So somebody before said retail is overbuilt. Who said that back there? Okay, tell me, what, is he, what do you mean by that? You know what's interesting, and Professor, in terms of your study that you did, and I know you hit hard on this, and it's so true, that here in the United States, we have this mentality that if you build it, they will come. And I used to think that that meant the consumer, 
But to your point, it's really the retailer in many cases. You know, as I, I got here a few minutes early today and uh, kind of looked around the market, spent a little bit of time walking the mall area and also driving around the ring road, I saw Panera Bread. You familiar with where Panera Bread is? And Panera Bread moved from across the street and they went ahead and they located here. Um, why? Drive-through, yeah. So we'll talk a little bit later about some of the changes that's going on in designs, but obviously retailers are trying to figure out what, what they want to be and how they want to be and, and the growth. But the fact is, here in the United States, we have 24 square feet for you, 24 for you, 24 for you. So we are clearly overbuilt because our counterparts you know, across the pond, guess how many square feet they have per person of retail? Throw out a number. Eight, high, a little high. It's more like two to three square feet. So back in the heyday, back in 2007, 2008, before the Great Recession, we were building like crazy across the United States, but in particular in my sandbox, which is Chicago, our high point, was back in like 2007, and we, when I say we, I'm using that word very loosely, because we tend to be fairly, or my company tends to be fairly conservative, but the market was building 8 million square feet that year. 8 million square feet! Well, needless to say, a lot of it didn't get leased up, to your point, and got recycled. A lot of it went back to the lenders. A lot of it basically became non-retail. But the interesting thing is about retail, because of the fact that it is you know, changing, evolving, complicated, somebody's downturn becomes somebody else's opportunity. Believe it or not, this mall can have a second life. There is opportunities out there for this kind of a space. Up in Chicago, we've had a lot of big boxes close. And again, whether those are department stores like Sears, uh, Pennies, but to Walmart, Target, Carson's, Toys R Us, Sports Authority, Sam's Club, we have right now about 12 and a half million square feet of vacant boxes in Chicagoland. Wow. How would you like to be the landlord sitting on that, the lender on that? And obviously you can cry about the fact that it's closed, but to me, those are opportunities. You may be familiar with Walmart. Walmart has been a client of mine for about the last eight years. Walmart, when they go ahead and decide to move, relocate, expand, they basically come to me and say, Mike, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna give you this big box in Madison. We're gonna give you this big box in the city of Chicago. You need to figure out what to do with it. So we've gone ahead with Walmart, within their big boxes, we've done lots of self-storage, we've done fulfillment centers, we've done churches, and my favorite just opened up earlier this month. We took, have you ever been into a Walmart neighborhood market? You familiar with that? Do you have one in town here? Or somewhere, but, okay. So it's about 30,000 square feet, so it's not a super center although I've done a lot of super centers. It's about 30,000 square feet. This one happens to, or happened to be, in the West Loop of Chicago, okay? Prime real estate, so you know, a little bit different, but it was also in the base of a high-rise building. And so I tried to backfill that with a grocer. I tried to backfill that with other retailers until I finally heard about a car dealership that was interested in locating in the Loop area of Chicago. So needless to say, as a broker, partial developer, I jumped over the opportunity to talk to Napleton, who's one of the largest car dealerships in the United States, and lo and behold, there is a new Porsche dealership in what was, in what was formerly that Walmart space. And a little side note here, um, probably the most difficult deal I've ever done because I didn't have one, didn't have two. I had three 800-pound gorillas that I needed to negotiate through to get a deal done. 
So a little bit challenging. We eventually got it done. We ended up doing a sublease, did a lease, parking lot agreement, and it took about a, a little bit over a year of my time. But to needless to say, the aldermen, the city, Napleton, Walmart, the landlord, uh, as well as Porsche are thrilled that it's done. So again, somebody, you, you can look at life in terms of being negative. Uh, I may, believe it or not, I am a half full glass guy. I like to look at opportunities out of the challenges that we're going through. So let's take a look at a few slides here. Anyone familiar with Placer? No? Somebody hold up your phone. Hold it up, okay? So right now, you may not know this, but I think you probably know this. People know that you're in here right now. They're tracking this, okay? You know that, and you've accepted that as a consumer for the most part. Some of you may not, but Placer, AL, is a company that has figured out how to be able to track you as a consumer. And they know when you go into a store and when you go to sleep at night because your phone is, for the most part, inactive. They have over 30 million cell phones that they track around the United States. Is this news to anybody? No, not at all. You probably just didn't know Placer, okay? But Placer helps me do my job because it helps me to track retail, track consumers, understand maybe where there are voids in the marketplace, where there are opportunities to be able to do something. This, and I'm going to show you a few slides here, which I think are important. And again, I'm going to go ahead and give you my deck so you can certainly share that with the group here. But this basically goes ahead and shows uh, really the change in foot traffic from 2019 to 2021. Because if we went ahead and we compared the numbers to last year, needless to say, they would be significantly higher or lower this year, foot traffic. They're going to be higher, obviously, OK? So this goes ahead and compares really to our last really complete year. This goes ahead and does it state by state. All categories uh, were down for the year about almost 3% in terms of foot traffic. And then what it does, it also goes ahead and shows you in terms of the different categories. Electronics is down significantly, about 13.5%. Interesting enough, electronics did pretty well during COVID. Okay? Uh, why is that? Why do you think it did well? Something to do while you're at home. What else did you do while you were at home? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You may not necessarily have gone into the store last year, but you certainly went ahead and went online and you bought a better camera. Okay. What else did we do last year? Online schooling. We've done a lot of that. Yep. A lot of outdoor things. Okay. Did anyone eat last year? Did anyone cook a little bit more last year? Maybe. Okay. Grocery stores did exceptionally well last year, okay? And we've got, I think we've got groceries up here. Grocery from 2019 to 2021 is up about 2%, okay? So that's, that's, that's pretty good. So anyway, that just gives you a pretty good overview. Uh, this is another um, slide that I got from Placer, and it goes ahead and, it, and tracks, again, foot traffic. You'll notice, excuse me, back here in April and May, when we were at the peak of COVID, in terms of how foot traffic was down from the previous year, you start to experience some actual growth then earlier this year. So again, very positive. People are getting back out again and starting to, if you will, experience retail. So all very, very positive. Uh, this goes ahead and gives you, again, a little bit of a breakout in terms of, the, again, the foot traffic, and it focuses in on the different categories. As I mentioned before, you can take a look at electronics, uh, which had a nice high and obviously a decreasing a little bit during the summer months. So this slide, okay, this is interesting. This has to do with malls 
<coughs> excuse me, as well as open air malls. And what I'm talking about there is primarily more lifestyle centers. So as you can see in the, ch the chart here, certainly interior malls were hit hardest and people still maybe don't feel comfortable getting back into a mall setting, but they're certainly feeling a lot more comfortable in terms of getting out into a shopping center environment. Okay, This is interesting, again, Placer data goes ahead and will we'll track in terms of how long you were actually shopping at a mall. It'll also tell you in terms of days. But I want to focus in on retail sales because at the end of the day, this is really uh, the, the key for me. So this slide that I have here is from CBRE's second quarter of this year retail sales report. And so I rely on very, a lot of different publications in regards to tracking retail and sales. What you'll see here is the total retail sales in the second quarter grew by 31% year over year. Okay? So that's comparing that to last year's. That's why the jump is so high, so high. And sales for that quarter were 1.87 trillion. What's interesting is that core retail sales, which we go ahead and we'll pull out automobiles and we'll pull out gasoline sales, that grew by 24%. Unbelievable numbers. The thing that I think is really telling here is that for the first time since the second quarter of 2011, all retail categories had a gain, and that has not happened in over 10 years. So that's positive, extremely positive. One of the things that I can't quite yet figure out is apparel. Apparel in the quarter actually grew by 161%. How many people here buy clothes in a store? So interesting, more than I would have guessed. Do you also buy them online? You say no. Why? Yeah. Okay. So un unlike my wife, you know, and she, she'll buy clothes in the store, but she'll also buy a lot of clothes online. I'm always thrilled when I get home and there's all the Amazon bags there. And she does what a lot of people do is she'll buy lots of things. She'll try them on at home. And then she will what? Return them. You know, that's a real problem that retailers have is obviously, you know, in terms of those returns. But, hey, that's their thing. What's interesting is as we start to look now into the third quarter, we've had a relatively strong back-to-school selling period as really as people are finally getting off of the Zoom calls and getting back into the classroom setting that they're, bu they're buying. And so that, along with a little bit of the stimulus check, has helped to drive sales this year. Many are predicting sales forecasting for the holiday season at about 7%, which is absolutely unbelievable. I think it's great. The problem that we're going to run into is I was watching the Today News um, this morning, and they were talking about the supply chain problems that we're having. And they were going ahead and they were showing all these tankers around all of the various different ports in the United States. And the fact is that they can't come in they're, 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 they, they can only handle so many of, at a given time. So the problem for us as consumers is, are we going to get our goods? Or, if you will, are the retailers going to get their goods so they can put it on the shelf and that you can go ahead and try it on and then to be able to buy it? And so that's a problem. But again, for the most part, I think people are probably pretty optimistic. Let's spend a little bit of time and talk about my favorite subject, e-commerce, okay? It used to be that uh, the internet um, was kind of a, a dirty word in the retail arena. And people were all concerned about it in terms of the impact that it was going to have on brick and mortar. And, uh, you know, is it going to be something that, you know, people are going to stay away from retail and literally just go ahead and focus in on e-commerce? E and I think we have found out, and I think the numbers kind of demonstrate this, is that the retailers that have embraced the internet are the retailers that are going to continue to grow and are going to be able to survive. So prior to COVID, the only thing that retailers were focusing in on was, again, the internet. 
and you know the online sales. So this slide shows retail commerce from 2019 to 2025. Back in 2019, e-commerce was approximately about 11%. So help me do the math here. So if e-commerce is 11%, what percentage are people buying in stores? 89%, you know? That's still pretty good. Now last year, because we were forced to go and you know shop online, that surged about 34% to be 14% of total retail sales. And it feels like where we're tracking this year, it's gonna be probably, when we all settle down, about 15% of total retail sales is gonna be on the internet. And that's going to account for about $1.65 trillion. What's interesting, as you start to forecast, out a little bit, that looks to me like about 24% of total retail sales will be uh, you know, happening in 2025. So the real winners, needless, needless to say, in terms of e-commerce last year was who? Who had the most sales? Amazon. How many people love Amazon? Why do you love it? Anything you want. And you can get it right now. In fact, I just ordered something that will be delivered here in the next five minutes. You know, it's, it's crazy. And you know what's interesting about Amazon? They're really not even a retailer. They're not. They're not a retailer. What you, Amazon is here for, and what they want to do is they want to figure you out as a consumer. They want all the information about you. And they'll go ahead and they'll use the platform to figure out your shopping habits, your sleeping habits, your interest, and then they'll do something with that. Amazon just announced not too long ago that they're getting into the department store business. Now, not really the department store business that we had, you know, here at with Sears or J.C. Penney. You know, it'll be probably a, you know, maybe 50,000 square foot store, maybe more of a fulfillment center that will be open to the consumer. Has anyone here been to an Amazon grocery store? You have? Where? Okay. Now, again, I'm not talking about an Amazon to go, where you literally don't even need to pull out your checkbook or your money, and literally because you have your Prime, mem prime member, and you, you'll pick up some items there, and it will automatically charge your account. I'm talking about a 30, yes. That's a great answer. So again, tell us about Whole Foods. So Amazon, which has an unbelievable appetite, okay, to buy anything and everything, uh, they bought Whole Foods. They played an incredible amount of money for Whole Foods. They bought it so that they could understand a little bit about grocery stores obviously be able to connect in to their prime membership to Whole Foods. And with that now, now they are a lot smarter on grocery stores. And now they are opening up, outside of the Whole Foods arena, they're opening up these Amazon grocery stores. We now have about five of them in Chicago. They originally opened up in, California, in Southern California. And again, being a grocery guy, needless to say, I was very interested and in, intrigued to find out what it was and how it laid out and the technology. And I walked out of the grocery store going, I don't get it. I was expecting so much more. Uh, I didn't get any wow. I mean, yeah, the cart. They have the cart. You put an item in there. I put my bottle inside the cart, and it shows up on my screen on the grocery cart, and it says bottle of water, uh, 99 cents. Okay, that's kind of neat. And I don't necessarily have to go through the cash register. I could literally just go ahead and check that out. But the rest of the store eh, wasn't that great. But I'll tell you a story. Back when I was working at Jewel Osco, and our headquarters were out of Boise, no, uh, Salt Lake City, we jumped on a company jet, and we flew to a small town in Arkansas. Arkansas. You know what that town was? Bentonville, Bentonville. Who's in Bentonville? Walmart. And we said, we got to check out Walmart is getting into the grocery business. We walked that store with our suits on. I'm sure they knew that we weren't consumers. 
We didn't have a cart, but we walked that store. We walked out. I'm having trouble hearing you. Well, can you guys hear me okay? Every once in a while, she just acts up on me. Yes. Thank you. How are we doing time-wise? No, I know what time it is, but are you guys okay? A little bit longer? Because I've got lots more. I apologize. Okay. So we walked out of that store, and we laughed. We drank champagne on the company jet all the way home, and we said, you know what? These guys don't get it. They don't understand how to sell food. Well, guess what? Every store they opened up after that, they tweaked it, they refined it, and they improved it. So literally several years ago, they became the highest sale purveyor of food in the, in the world. Amazon will do the same thing. But Amazon's not done. They're going to be doing a lot more. So hey, let's focus in on some slides here. So this should look a little bit familiar. This is data that I got from Placer. And this goes ahead and uh, describes a little bit about the trade area that your current mall is shopping at. OK? So it takes all of that data from your phone and basically goes ahead and creates a dot. The hotter the dot, in other words, this red, orange, this is the highest concentration. That then defines the trade area for the people that are coming to Muncie Mall. 70% of the customers are coming within that hot area. Then as it starts to go a little further out, you get into green, you get into yellow, you get into eventually blue, OK? If you were to go ahead and throw a ring around that, you would see that probably 70% of your customers here are coming within maybe 10 miles. How big of a draw should a regional mall be? Maybe. Depends what the trade area is. I'm not going to ask the professor because he's obviously written studies on this. But certainly, you should have a larger distribution of those customers than what we see here. Okay? This goes ahead and compares Muncie Mall to Muncie Plaza. You guys familiar with Muncie Plaza? It's across the street. It's the Coles. It's uh, the AMC Theater. Okay? And as you, would, you can imagine, the amount of traffic at Muncie Mall is significantly less than it is across the street. This data is information that is available to you and might help you also with your charrette. This goes ahead and shows you, uh, again, Muncie Plaza is the red. It goes ahead and shows you that uh, the majority of the business is done on the weekends, and also the majority of the business is done between the hours of 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock. So again, lots of information out there. But let's talk about the future of retail. Okay, we've touched on some of this before. Uh, the in-store experience. Okay, this is what we used to talk about the last four or five years. Consumers, primarily you folks, you want to have an experience. You don't want to just get a can of corn. You want to be able to experience the corn. You want to be able to experience the cornflakes. Well, obviously, that whole experience shopping has slowed as we've been confined to our households. But with that said and done, shopping in a retail environment, if I as a retailer can give you something more than what you're coming for and you like the experience, you're going to come back. So all retailers are trying to focus in on creating experience. Again, you're from Chicago. Anyone else ever been to Chicago? You've been to Chicago. You're familiar with what used to be called Dominic's? And then Dominic's was sold to Safeway. And the guy who ran Dominic's was a guy by the name of Bob Mariano. You ever heard of Mariano's? You anybody here from Mariano's? OK, tell me about Mariano's grocery store. You had this experience, OK? And we also had uh, uh, a piano up in the front, OK? And if you wanted, you could get a glass of wine and walk around and get your can of corn and get your cereal, as well as you were having a nice Pinot Noir, OK? Well, what happened to Mariano's? Do you know? Anybody know what happened to Mariano's? The same thing that happened to a lot of retailers and other grocers. They got acquired. Okay? And this is what I call the corporatization of retail. 
okay? And what I mean by that is many of these companies are publicly traded, okay? You may even have a stock. You may have a, a participate in a mutual fund. They got bought by Kroger. Now, don't get me wrong. Kroger is a wonderful retailer. They're a lot more generic. So guess what happened to that experience that you had, used to be able to have at Mariano's? It fell to the wayside. Why? Because they needed to take cost out of the box. They needed to reduce their cost so that they could make a little bit more money and they could go ahead and appease Wall Street because in the corporatization world, you have to basically respond to Wall Street every quarter. And if you don't produce in terms of sales or reducing your expenses and increasing your profit, you're going to fall to the wayside like a lot of the retailers. Okay? So Bob Mariano started a new grocery store, and it's called Dom's Kitchen and Market. We opened up our first one back in June. Uh, it's in Lincoln Park. And again, if you have an opportunity to go see T Dom's, you will see retailing at its best. You will get that experience. You will enjoy the coffee. You'll enjoy the Star not Starbucks. You'll enjoy the bakery. You'll enjoy local products in an unbelievable setting. That is the in-store experience. Data. Data will drive retail. We just talked about Placer. That's all data. The world has gotten so much smarter now that when I decide to locate a Dom store, I know exactly where my customers are coming from. I know what their income levels are. I know how many cans of corn you bought. That's going to help me decide where I place my next store. Very, very helpful. Store closures are going to accelerate moving forward. No surprise there. The thing that has surprised me this year is there's not been as many bankruptcies as we've had in the years past. There haven't been as many store closures. Why is that? Anybody? Be What's that? The worst ones have already gone. I've already gone over to the wayside. And you as consumers have been spending more. Remember, retail sales are up. And the government. And again, I'm going to stay away from politics, but the government has definitely spurred on the economy by stimulus checks. And so that has stopped retailers from maybe closing as many stores. But I guarantee you, when I come back here next year, we will talk about more store closures. And again, that can be bad if you're that retailer, but it can also be good if maybe you're a retailer that wants to expand and get into that vacant box at maybe a lower rate. The impact of millennials. Needless to say, that consumer group and your consumer group, you know, you shop differently. And so we as retailers are trying to figure out how to get into your pocketbooks a little bit easier. What do you need? What do you want? What, what is driving you in terms of shopping? Smaller stores are in. It used to be that I would say bigger was better. Anyone familiar with Woodman's Grocery Store out of Wisconsin? Yeah? Yeah? Are you from Wisconsin? Okay, you, that area up there. So Woodman's is almost 200,000 square feet of cheese curds and, and, and uh, boxes of cereal. I went into Woodman's one time, and I didn't get out until the weekend. It's, that's crazy. So the, that experience is not what you're looking for. You're looking for something smaller. I do, I'm doing a lot of work right now with Jimmy John's. Anyone had a Jimmy John's today? Anyone going to have Jimmy John's tonight? Okay. Jimmy John's, you know, again, good retailer, you know, nice, nice Subway, Sam, not Subway, but a nice, uh, you know, sub, uh, sub, submarine sandwich. The group that I'm working with, they are the largest franchisees of Jimmy John's. And they've come to me and said, Mike, we need your help. And I said, what do you need my help for? And they said, we want to have smaller stores. And most importantly, we want to have drive throughs and outdoor dining areas. OK? That is very common right now with restaurants. Taco Bell has gone through redesign. McDonald's has gone through redesign. Uh, grocery stores realize that I don't need that big back room. People don't shop in the back room. They shop out in the store. 
And so retailers are not wanting to pay those bigger rents for space they're not using. So right now, and I see this happening for a long, long time, smaller is better. It's going to keep their costs down. And you as a consumer feel, are going to feel a lot more comfortable in a smaller 25, 30,000 square foot box than you might in a 200,000 square foot Woodman's. Okay. Last but not least, the marriage between e-commerce and brick and mortar. It's happening right among us. It's incredible. Warby Parker, you know, realized that, hey, online sales are great. But if I go ahead and I open up a brick and mortar store like Casper has done, that drives the sales certainly into the store, but it also drives their online sales also. Because people now, oh, Warby Parker, I've heard of them. I'm going to go ahead and buy it online. I don't necessarily need to go into the store. But again, similar to what you said about buying apparel and wanting to try it on, you can do that in the brick and mortar store. So we're seeing clearly a marriage of those two. So what's the future of malls? You know, here's a couple of different quotes, <coughs> excuse me, that, I, that I've got up there in regards to regional malls. And I, and I know that's a top of the mind for you folks in regards to Muncie Mall. Um, so I've got just a couple things that I want to share with you uh, in regards to some examples. This happens to be Fox Valley Mall. My friends here from Chicago are probably somewhat familiar with this. This is a mall that's in Aurora, which is a western community of uh, Chicago. It sits right adjacent to what I call the all-American city, which is Naperville, which is about 40 miles west of Chicago. We developed this back in 1975. The mall has about a million and a half square feet of retail. This may sound familiar. It used to have, an, uh, used to have Sears, it used to have a Marshall Field, a Carson's, a J.C. Penney. This sounding familiar. Sears went ahead and they closed in 2020. The owner of the mall, as well as the city, said we need to figure out how we're going to go ahead and, and reposition the mall. So they've gone ahead and they've put together a plan that is located on um, this happens to be on the north side of the mall where Sears was. And this is an 11-acre redevelopment. And uh, they started construction earlier this year. And what's going to happen here is they will be constructing kind of an adjacency to the mall that will include three three-story buildings of about 304 units, in addition, a small neighborhood park, as well as a gathering space. They realize that they need to create more of this experience, more of a community center. I was thrilled when I got here and I saw that you folks were in the mall and participating in terms of, you know, kind of a community gathering space. I think this is great. And I think that what, we're, what they're doing out in Aurora at Fox Valley Mall is certainly a trend that you're going to continue to see more of. This happens to be uh, Hawthorne, which is up in Vernon Hills, which is kind of northwest of Chicago by about 36 miles. Again, another mall that was developed by our company back in 1973, very similar to what we saw at Fox Valley. Let me just kind of fast forward. The redevelopment here is happening on what would be the east side of the mall, uh, where part of the Sears was. And what you're gonna end up getting there, again, a mixed use development, entertainment. Uh, you're gonna get a gourmet grocery store there. You're gonna have an open space. So again, trying to take advantage of the location of the mall and tying it back into the community. This is one of my favorites. This is, again, my client. And Walmart came up with what they call this reimagined program a few years ago. And it's a town center concept. What does Walmart have? Every Walmart out there has uh, along the street. What is it? They got a big sign. They got a big parking lot. Okay, got a big parking lot, and they realized, wait a minute, I don't need to have this big of a parking lot. When this was built, back in many cases the 70s or the 80s, they went ahead and they built these on a parking ratio of about five to six spaces for every thousand square feet of retail. They don't need that much. So they came up with an idea to reimagine it, and to go ahead and create kind of this town center concept, putting an additional building in, some outlot, outlot buildings, and really kind of creating, uh, again, a, 
community space, adding a, whether it's a church, adding a park district, uh, part of an entertainment, adding certain restaurants. And this will help drive business into the store. They're purposely not competing with themselves. So they're very selective in terms of who they rent to, but they want to be able to tie into their business. This is not just Walmart thinking of this idea. This is back to most of the grocery stores are doing it. If they have large parking fields, Home Depot. So again, they're figuring out how to deploy part of their assets, and rather than have it just as an expense, have it create also in terms of an income. So again, who's hot and who's not? We've touched on some of these before. Right now, restaurants are through the roof. So last year, we were all concerned that our favorite restaurant was going out of business. The Restaurant National Association was saying that about 25% of uh, restaurants were going to close and not open up. That's probably the case that happened. But I'll tell you, there are other restaurant tours that are backfilling those spaces. They're looking at reducing rents. They look at the fact that the infrastructure is already in place. So restaurants are extremely hot and are going to continue to grow. Uh, grocery stores are extremely hot. I mentioned before about Amazon, Amazon Fresh, Dom's Kitchen and Market. Those are active players in my marketplace. If Amazon isn't here, they will be here in the future, and they are expanding really throughout the country. So in my market, a lot of independents are continuing to grow, and don't tell them this, but my guess is that they're going to grow a little bit longer, and in my vision, as I look into my crystal ball, I think a lot of those independents will probably end up being out of business in the next five years, they do not have a succession plan. Many of their kids who grew up in the stores want nothing to do with the business. And some of them will be fortunate enough because they'll get a call from who? Who will call that grocery store and want to buy them? Amazon, Walmart, OK? Again, good, bad, or indifferent, that's the vision that I see in terms of grocery stores. Medtail, anyone familiar with Medtail? Medtail is medical in a retail environment, okay? So you've got physical therapy, you've got urgent care, you name it, that Medtail is getting into retail shopping centers. Way back when, when I made the jump from urban planning in the village of Lombard and went to work for Draper and Kramer the first time through, similar time, there was a mall, if you're familiar with, again, the people from Chicago are familiar with uh, Hickory Hills. It was a mall that was, a, was loaned by the Bank of Montreal. It was a shopping center of about 250,000 square feet in size. It had a very strong Jewel Osco, a Walgreens, a Hallmark card store, and a Subway. Over half the shopping center was vacant, was vacant. And so the, the developer gave that property back to the, the, uh, the mall, uh, excuse me, the bank. The bank called me and said, we need your help. First thing I did, because of my planning background, is I kind of studied the trade area. There, in that area, there is a lot of road systems. There's a lot of forest preserves. There's not a lot of bodies. There's not a lot of people there. And so they had overbuilt the shopping center. The developer was long gone. The bank was there sitting with the assets, and they said, Mike, figure it out. So what I did is I was fortunate enough to realize that great location, good intersection, accessible, why not education, health and fitness, uh, a lot of non-retail type users. I was fortunate enough to land my first deal with Lewis University for a satellite facility. I ended up doing a health fitness place. I ended up doing an urgent care. The only dilemma that I ran into is those tenants, many of them have leases that restrict what you can do in the shopping center. So I quickly realized that I needed to have a cup of coffee with Jewel Osco to allow me to put non-retail in the center. And what I thought was going to be a half an hour conversation ended up taking me six months to eventually get them to come on board and to realize that this is going to be beneficial. Along the way, 
I got to know Jewel very well and how that store did well. It was only 50,000 square feet. They needed to be about 65,000 square feet. And I ended up doing a expansion of the store, revising their lease, and allowing me to put non-retail in it. So when we were finished up with those lease negotiations, the guy at Jewel pulled me aside and he said, hey, you ever thought about being a retailer? And I pounded my chest and I said, I'm a developer. I'm a broker. I'm a problem solver. And they said, well, think about it. They offered me a job. I didn't take it. But nine months later, I was hearing about the, how they were expanding and outside of Chicago into Wisconsin. And I went to go visit them, thinking there may be an opportunity there for me to work with them. And before I left, I had a job in my hand. Uh, they ended up hiring me. And through a, a series of circumstances and luck, I ended up getting to run the real estate program for Jewel Osco in uh, the Midwest. So my point of that discussion is you never know when the opportunities are going to be presented to you. You need to put yourself out there. You need to network. You need to be able to engage and to find out. And I hope that you're as fortunate as I am to find something that you love and you enjoy because that's what I've done in terms of retail. So I promised you a gift, okay? I appreciate you guys working with me on the time. We'll get you out of here in a minute. But if you're interested, I, for the last 10 years, have put together um, basically a booklet having to do with the new and active retailers in the Midwest. This happens to track all the retailers that are growing in the Midwest area, who they are, uh, also their square footage. If you're interested in getting a copy of this, all you need to do is, remember that business card that I gave you in the beginning? Send me an email, ask me for a copy of this, and I'll send it to you. This may be of some value to you as you start to look at what to do with Muncie Mall moving forward. Um, questions? Anything? Yes, please. The Muncie Mall is what? Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, the mayor. Yes, please take my card. Mayor, again, I, I'm fully vaccinated. Thank you so much for joining us today. I thought, when I saw him kind of walk in and sit in the back, I thought maybe a graduate student, maybe a professor. I didn't realize that we had the mayor with us. This is wonderful. Yes. So how do you get somebody's attention? How do you realize that you've got to look at things differently? Yes. This is from a banker. I'm a former banker. A recovering banker. So, um, and again, we, we don't want to pick on any, any, uh, any specific fields here, but you will realize, if you haven't already, that not everybody pays attention to you. Not everybody beats to your drum. You know, you may, you know, want to, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm going to use an old adage here. You may want that girl that's in your uh, arts and literature class to pay attention to you. And so how do you get her attention? You know, what can you do to entice her or, uh, you know, the instructor or, heaven forbid, a banker in a project? You need to figure out a way to connect the dots, okay? And I know that sounds easier than it is, but in today's world, it's a lot easier. Remember that? dirty thing I talked about in the internet. The internet has so much information out there. And does anyone know who Kevin Bacon is? What do, what do they say? Seven to seven degrees, you know, uh, to Kevin Bacon. I bet that somehow, some way, there's somebody at that bank that can help you connect with who that decision maker is. The thing that I have found out is Right now, to that bank, 
This is a piece of paper. It's, 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 a, it's, an, it's an item on an accounting sheet, and it looks red because it's bleeding. Your largest taxpayer in Muncie is who? Who is it? It's the mall. It's the mall, okay? So there's a reason why he's here. Because what's going to happen to the future of Muncie Mall in terms of the impact that it's going to have on the community? So he's doing what he's been hired to do, which is to try to figure out how to engage this asset, make it more successful. Because the last thing the bank wants to do is continue to pay that real estate tax, which is probably very high. More than likely, they have dropped the valuation because of the fact that there's no income being produced here. And in the retail, or in the re, uh, retail arena, how we value assets is based on the income that can be arrived. And so as the income goes down, the valuation goes down, the taxes go down, and guess who then has to pay the burden that isn't being paid by the mall? The people, the residents. So again, my easy answer is to give me a call and let's figure this out together in terms of how we can get the bank to go ahead and pay attention to what needs to happen here. And sometimes the best way is because what the bank wants to do is they want to get out of this, okay? How do we get the bank out of the equation here? How do we do that? Yeah. You buy the property. Somebody's, somebody's going to buy the property. Because remember we said before, somebody's downturn is somebody else's opportunity. There's somebody outside of this room and that is outside of Muncie that would see this as an opportunity, but only if the bank reduces the value. And so the bank's going to have to figure out a way, like I did back in Hickory Hills, on how to get out of the ownership business. And the way that we did it there was we ended up leasing to non-retail. We put together a program. You guys are embarking on that in terms of the charrette. You're going to come up with all different ideas. Some of them are going to be crazy. You need to think outside of the envelope, you know? Think of something they haven't thought of before, and hopefully the mayor, the city, the bank will then have something that they can then sell to a developer. Those two projects that I shared with you in the suburbs, okay, are owned by a developer by the name of Centennial. Centennial is a developer that focuses in on Heaven forbid that I would say a dead mall. They buy them cheap, they reposition them, and they may hold them, or eventually they'll put a bow on them and sell it. That's what we want to be able to see happen here. But we've got to have a plan. Got to have a plan of attack. You got to have a municipality that can help get this project done. We didn't talk at all about the tools that are available to planners and to the public, tax increment financing, sales tax, reven revenue generating things. There's lots of different tools that are available out there to assist you to get a mall back to where it should, not back, but to its next generation. Other questions? You guys have been a great audience. Thank you so much. I appreciate you spending a little bit of extra time with me. I'm going to be around for a little bit. Uh, if you can want to talk some more, please do. If you want to engage with me afterwards, uh, you've got my card. Please reach out to me. But most importantly, enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your lives. Thanks again. Thank you so much. My hat goes off to the AV guys. I apologize uh, if the sound levels were up or down or bouncing around. So hopefully you caught everything you could. So thank you guys for all your help. Are you going to leave this for me? No. Yeah, yeah, this is yours. Please. Yes. Let me put this down. Hi, I have a question. I'm going to come over there. Okay. okay.